Great. And, um, you know, October has been designated National uh, Security Month, National Retirement Security Month. And this symposium is actually to acknowledge uh, National Retirement Security Month. And its purpose is actually to raise awareness of the importance of saving for retirement and to increase financial literacy to help people achieve retirement security. Well, there's another type of security that is just as important, and that is the security of your identity. And identity thieves and scam artists, they are lurking everywhere. So uh, thanks to Delaware Funds by Macquarie, I have the privilege of introducing and we have the we all have the privilege of listening to our guest speaker this morning, Jeff Lanza. So hi, Jeff. Hello, Jeannie. Hello, everyone. Thank you for having me. Yep. Jeff, Jeff knows a thing or two about identity theft and, and so much more. He's a former FBI agent with more than 20 years experience. And during that time, he investigated cybercrime, organized crime, human trafficking and terrorism. Uh, Jeff has also lectured at Harvard and uh, Princeton universities, and he's also written some books, highly, uh, highly recognized and reviewed books. And not only that, you may have seen him in a Netflix documentary about the FBI, um, and he often appears on national television news programs discussing the growing threat of cybercrime as well as prevention. So, you know, listen up. We're all very fortunate to have him here with us. And so, uh, Jeff, I'm going to welcome you and hand over that remote and Fantastic. click on the screen a couple of times. And right. I am going to stop my video and it's all yours. All right. Very good. Thank you. Thank you, Jeannie. Thank you, everyone, for being here. Um, I assume you can see me on the screen. I've got my camera turned on. So uh, we're going to start um, the presentation. I prefer if I can share my screen, I'd be able to uh, then share my slides from my presentation. Right now, my screen is disabled. Uh, my screen sharing is disabled. So maybe if we can get that going, uh, that would help me to... Uh, to do my presentation. Um, and I'll start with um, just a little background on me, which you just heard. I spent 20 years with the FBI, and for most of my career, I was involved in white collar crime. Wait, let me take that back. I investigated white collar crime. I wasn't involved in it myself, but cyber crime and identity theft are two types of white collar crime that we're going to be focusing on in this presentation. Again, thank you for being with me today. And uh, thank you for hearing about all these important topics as uh, we try to endeavor to keep you safe from these from some of these threats. So this is a picture of me uh, going on national TV. This is just a screenshot, but they asked me on this show about how the hackers commit the crimes. We're going to get into that today and how to stay safe. They also asked me, you know, about the incentive. It's almost always for profit. You know, we can't change that, but we can make it more difficult for them to get to profit. Sometimes we can take profit away. And if we do that, we'll be less likely to be victimized. So first, we're going to cover identity theft, and then we're going to cover cybercrime from two different angles. There is a handout that goes with my presentation. It looks like this. It has four, uh, five pages in total. Uh, you'll see the last two pages are on cybercrime. There's two pages on identity theft. And there's a lot more information about uh, how to stay safe and also resources that you can use to protect yourself as well. All right. First thing I recommend uh, as you approach retirement, or even if you're not at near approaching retirement, is to set up an online Social Security account. This is particularly important if you are at the age of 62 where you're eligible to collect benefits, because at that age, a criminal can go online and set up an account using your identity and have your benefits sent to their bank account. So set up this online account to prevent that from happening. You'll have that online presence, and you also can interact with the Social Security Administration using this online portal at any point in your life and check your benefits and estimates throughout your lifetime. Second thing I recommend is to freeze your credit reports. We almost have to assume our social security number is in the hands of a criminal. There's been so many breaches involving social security numbers 
Look at the number of people that had their social security numbers for sale, 24 million people. This is an example of how the government tries to take down these dark web pages where they're selling socials. And a series of those was taken down by the FBI and also um, uh, by the IRS and the Department of Justice. But just because this site and others were shut down, more can pop up, more can be selling our information. But remember a second ago, I mentioned profit. We could take profit away from the criminals and reduce that as an incentive. So look at the amount of money that was generated for criminals using this one website, not the dark website, $19 million. And so we could take profit away by freezing your credit reports. If you freeze your credit reports, the criminals can't get loans in your name. They can't open up credit card accounts in your name. Even if they've purchased your social security number on another dark website that wasn't shut down by the IRS and the FBI. So that takes profit away. If there's no profit, we'll be less likely to be victimized. So how do you freeze your credit reports? So on the handout that I just mentioned, I'm blowing up a piece of that for you. So you can see I have listed on the handout, which will be delivered to you later, all the credit reporting agencies information, specifically their websites. There's a dedicated website on all the credit reporting agency sites uh, that allows you to freeze your credit reports very easily. And so once you do that, you cannot be victimized by the type of fraud that I just mentioned. No credit card accounts will get opened in your name. No loans will be opened in your name. Now, if you went to TransUnion site, just to give you an example of how this works, you could simply set up your credit freeze to the left. You can lift the freeze when you want to get credit checked yourself and you even protect other members of your family from fraud. So doing this keeps you safe. And by the way, all of this is free. It doesn't cost money to freeze or lift freeze or to freeze them again. It doesn't affect your credit card relationships. It doesn't change your credit scores. It only keeps you safe from fraud. I've done it myself. It's really easy. I highly recommend it to prevent many types of fraud, given that our social is out there for sale in many cases. All right, let's talk about some other things you can do. I'm going to focus on now ongoing things that you have to do to stay safe. First thing I recommend here is to never, ever do this. And you know what I mean. Don't mix pansies with salvia. They just don't work well together. Talking about the flag, the eel mail. They will take mail from your mailbox before the post office picks it up. What they mainly look for are checks. If a criminal got a check from your mailbox, they could take the ink off a check, wash it off, and write the check out to themselves. Now that's called check washing. It's been around for a long time. And the way criminals uh, capitalize on this is your signature is still on their check. So most banks will honor that check and makes it difficult for you to get your money back because your signature is on the check. All right, so there's a couple of solutions to this type of identity theft and this type of fraud. First of all, highly recommend that you use gel pens to, wipe, to wash, excuse me, to write your checks, gel pens. The liquid in a gel pen can't be washed off using the methods that they use. It's harder for them to do that versus ballpoint ink. Take checks to the post office, preferably an inside location at the post office, much more secure than exterior blue boxes, which are being broken into around the country, criminals looking for checks. Paying bills electronically is a lot more secure, either by mobile or computer. We'll talk about online security in a second and how to keep those devices uh, uh, secure, but, uh, your checks are never going through the mail system, so you don't have to worry about check washing and checks being stolen. Uh, I also recommend, this is a, just a picture of a, the, uh, as you can see, someone checking out at the grocery store. And a lot of people ask me, we're on the topic of using mobile devices to do things. They say, is it safe to use mobile devices to pay at, your, at the checkout points as these point of sale uh, systems and absolutely secure. So you can swipe your credit card. That's the least secure method as it's not encrypted the entire way as it communicates with the credit card uh, processing company. You can insert it. That's much more secure using chip or you can tap it also much more secure using tokens which keep those transactions secure and using Apple Pay or Google Pay and other types of pay, uh, pay products from your phone also very secure using a token system. So one thing about mobile devices, they can be used securely to pay at the checkout location, the checkout stand in your various places where you purchase things. All right, let's go on to the next topic. 
go right here to this one. All right, do not use a strip cut shredder. It is not secure enough. Anything that has more than your name and address should be sh shredded securely with a secure shredder. That would be a cross cut, a micro cut, or another type of shredder, a diamond cut shredder. That should be shredded. Uh, that should be used to shred anything that has more than your name and address. That's not alone is not necessary to shred that. That's not sensitive, but certainly account numbers and birth dates and social security numbers obviously should be shredded with a secure shredder. Going paperless is a great option for security as well. As criminals target these items in incoming mail, they target them in trash if they're not shredded properly. And limit, eliminating that possibility, uh, going paperless will eliminate the possibility that criminals will get those items. And it also saves a few treats. So you're being green as well. Watch out for fake phone calls and text messages as well. Criminals will use these to try to trick us. If uh, someone calls and says they're with the Social Security Administration or Amazon calling saying there's someone bought an iPhone on your account, don't believe them. It would be hard enough to get these organizations on the phone if you needed to talk to them. I guarantee they're not reaching out and, and calling people. Amazon is happy when someone bought an iPhone on your account. Your credit card company will catch fraud before Amazon cares about it. So don't believe those phone calls. Don't provide any information or go to websites as a result of an unsolicited phone call or text message as well, regardless of what they say. Call the institution if you need to at a number you know to be for them, not one that's in the text message if you uh, suspect this might be fraud and those unsolicited text messages often are and phone calls. Um, the, you know, if you want to block spam, the, the cell phone providers are doing a much better job of doing that today. The phone providers do it. Third-party apps do it. You can, hold, you can use spam blockers to block those calls. Uh, much better at blocking not all the calls. We are getting less of those based on current federal initiatives. But remember, if you're not answering the call, if you get those blocked, they don't have to worry about anyone trying to get information from you or tricking you into getting the information. Now, emails can also be used for fraud. Uh, if you look at this email closely, I doubt the Treasury Department of the federal government is communicating from a Gmail account and asking you in a non-secure email for personal information. What is a routine number? I think they mean routing number, but why would they need that if they're going to send you a check, right? So none of this makes sense to begin with, especially the content of the email doesn't even make sense. Uh, sometimes you'll get emails that look like they're coming from, you know, that you missed a delivery. It might be coming from Amazon or FedEx. These are designed to send you to fake login pages or potentially ask you for personal information uh, as well. Here's a question for you. Are there more Elvis impersonators in the world or website impersonators, Amazon website impersonators? According to Wikipedia, there's a lot of Elvis impersonators in the world. If one tenth of that amount was correct, I'd still think there'd be too many Elvis impersonators in the world. But what we're talking about is fake websites. Criminals will direct us there. How do you know you're on the right site? Well, let's use Amazon as an example. And this really applies to any site where you're going to put in personal information. Clicking on the lock it gives you a drop down certificate. So you know there's a lock should be there to indicate secure a secure communication. But clicking on the lock, that reveals a drop down which tells you who that site is actually registered to. So you can see in this case it's registered to Amazon uh, and it's uh, and it's important to know that because there's a lot of fake or imposter sites that have been set up with criminals trying to get specific information from us when we log in or do even more than that on the fake sites. So clicking on the lock gives you that certificate. All right, let's go on to the next section. We're going to talk about some tricks. We've covered a lot already. We'll have a summar summary at the end. And don't forget, you're going to get, be getting a handout, which covers all of this information as well. This section, I usually like to start out by answering a question I'm often asked. People say, Jeff, when did you join the FBI? The answer is 1988. There's a picture of me getting my credentials with the disguise on, it looks like almost, or Groucho Marx joining the FBI with the mustache. Sometimes people think, are you going undercover in that disguise? I would be a terrible, terrible undercover agent. That's not my my skill um, set at all. But um, I joined the FBI because I wanted to investigate the mob. And that interest came from a very interesting tradition that my family had. I come from a big Ital Italian family. I grew up in Connecticut. And every Christmas, we sat around the TV and we watched a movie on Christmas. A lot of people think the movie that taught me about life and loyalty and how business should be conducted was not a movie about the mob. It was like a wonderful life, right? 
No, we watched The Godfather every Christmas, and that got me interested in not joining the mob, but investigating the mob. So when I got to Kansas City as a brand new FBI agent in 1988, I got to work a mob case. I was on a wiretap on a mobster's phone, listening to a mobster getting as he got a call from another one. And listen to this call or, or follow along with me because there's a lesson here. So starting at the top, Tony gets a call from Joe. And as the FBI listens to the call, Tony says, Joe, I'm really glad you called. And Joe goes, yeah, why? And Tony goes, I got a little problem. I think the FBI is tapping my phone. And Joe says, well, what are you going to do about it? And Tony says, well, I got a new number. So here we go. Lacking any common sense, Joe goes, OK, good. Give me the number. Now, Tony gets a little common sense. He says, I better not give it to you on the phone. I'll meet you for lunch and give it to you then. And Joe says, well, I can't meet you for lunch. Tony says, OK, I'll give it to you now on the phone, but I'll give it to you backwards. Yeah, he gave him the seven digits in reverse order. Now, what did the FBI do? We got our best criminologist on that one right away. We had the number figured out in record time. It just took us six months with the powerful computers we had in 1988. But, you know, I used this example. It is a true story, not the six-month part of the story, but about the phone call because it illustrates a key point. How critical is common sense in everyday life? When it comes to preventing scams, it's important, too. Because what criminals try to do is manipulate our thinking so we're not using common sense. They want us to use emotions to make decisions. And when we do that, we might be more easily tricked. In fact, we can't assess risk as easily when we're using emotions rather than logic and common sense. Now, let's look at some of these real examples of how they try to do that. So as the term implies, an account takeover is where someone gets access to your an online account. Now, one way they can do that is by sending an email that elicits an emotional reaction. Now, if you got an email that looked like it was coming from the IRS, you might have an emotional reaction. But if you open the email, it doesn't do any harm to your computer. But what it does do is tell you this doesn't make sense already, because if this were the case, the IRS would send you a physical letter in the mail, not an email. But emotionally, some people may click on that attachment, and that could put malware on your computer. Now, since you're looking at the PDF file, we're not seeing the animation term, but we are able to determine that you should not click on an attachment in an email someone you don't recognize uh, or something that doesn't make sense like this. And that could put malware on your computer. So let's say someone clicks on that. What can happen? Uh, what can happen next? And if we can go to the next slide, having a little trouble advancing the slides right now. There we go. Sorry about that. Now we're advancing too quickly. So bear with me for just a second, and we're going to back up with a slight delay here. Okay, so let's say someone puts in... their username and password there into their computer after the malware has been loaded on their computer. Um, and that, that information, using the malware the criminal planted on the computer because they clicked on that attachment, that information then goes to the criminal who set up that, uh, sent that malware out to begin with. And so that's a really bad situation if it happens, but it's really easy to prevent if we're just careful where we click. So when emails from unknown senders or from suspicious senders or ones that don't make sense, we just don't click on the attachment in the email. That'll keep us safe. And there's another thing that you see on the screen now that can also help you uh, see that a sender is being spoofed. So in this case, this email looks like it's coming from the IRS, but it's being spoofed to trick us. If you take your mouse and hover, not click on it this time, but hover, just hold it there, you'll see that this sender is not really the IRS, it's from someone with a Gmail account. Hovering helps reveal that. Now on the next screen, you're, see <laughs> you're seeing a picture of me on an FBI wanted poster. That's not, uh, that's not where my picture actually is, but we're seeing a wanted poster of an individual named Igor. And again, since we're not seeing the animations here, uh, uh, you're not seeing uh, what would have come up before this. But we're seeing the picture of Igor. 
has uh, wanted is wanted by the FBI since about March of 2022 for doing exactly what we're talking about. He's stealing online creden credentials, selling them on an online marketplace, and profiting it, profiting that way. So, how do we stay safe from his tricks? Because he's not going to be extradited to the United States to face charges. He's out of the reach of the U.S. government, so there's no consequences to his acts. There's no deterrence. So what's going to happen to him? He continue to do these things, but we can stop him if we know his tricks. So I've already showed you one trick, and let's look at another trick that he uses to try to deceive us, a fake website. And not just Igor, and not just somebody in Russia. It could be anyone in this country or around the world that could be trying to trick us with links to fake websites that are delivered to us through the internet. So this is an email, an example of an email that looked like it was coming from a bank. Now I've taken out the real bank logo here and the real bank name that was in the link, but I'll show you how criminals dress things up to make them look more real. Now the link looks okay, and why would you want to click on that link? Well, they're gonna pay you money to fill out a, a survey. Well, that's just a trick to get you to click on the link. It looks like a real link, but if you hover to discover using your mouse over the link, you'll see at the bottom of the screen, the link is not what it appears to be, it's being spoofed to trick us. So remember to use hovering to help reveal that on a computer. And I'll show you how to do that on a mobile device in a second. Also notice two letters in this real example in the country. Your bank or my bank is hosting websites in Russia. So where does that link take you? Well, it takes you to a fake website. The criminal is going to the criminal is going to uh, try to take those credentials and put them in at the real site, uh, and they may not have luck doing that. Most banks are not going to let that happen so easily. But still, we have a role in keeping online banking secure, which it generally is. And we're going to make sure that we log in directly, not through links. Even if a link looks good, like I showed you, even if an email looks good, uh, which I showed you as well. We're going to make sure we don't log in through that link. You would go to the bank site directly. And if there's money or a survey to be had, you can access it at the bank website, but not by clicking on the link. Another thing you see on the slide is important to set up alerts on financial accounts. This is a nice backup just in case something happens. In the FBI, we always like backups because things can go wrong. And just in case someone gets access to a financial account, the sooner you know about it, the better, the better it will be in terms of getting money revert, getting fraud reversed and preventing future fraud. Mobile devices are considered to be very secure. Those apps are locked behind many layers of security, but we have a role in keeping the device secure as well, and that's using the passcode. Now using the passcode uh, will make sure that no one can get access to that device and it protects all the apps. You probably have more information on the mobile device than you have in a file cabinet at home. You want to make sure you protect that with the passcode as well. Now, mobile devices can also be used uh, to get alerts, as I mentioned, but alerts can be fake as well. So the one on the top, what you're seeing there, um, what you're seeing on the top is uh, an email, excuse me, a text message that looks like it's uh, coming from a financial institution, but you wouldn't call the number in the text message. You're going to call the number on the back of your credit card to make sure you're talking to the right people. In the next one, you're seeing a text message where they put a link in it. If you press in that link, it's going to take you to a fake site because it's not even .com, it's a .corn site. I've taken out the bank name here. So if you wanted to go to the bank site, you want to do it through the link in the text message, and that's going to take you to the fake site. Uh, you would use the, on your mobile device, you're going to use the app instead. And if you use the app, you know you're going to be locked behind those little security. And then you're in the right place. I want to show you an example. I got an email that looked like it was coming from my bank, uh, excuse me, from PayPal. And you're going to see that on the next screen as that pops up. And um, But it wasn't from PayPal. And so I decided I needed to hover, but you can't hover with a mouse over a link. So what you can do is press and hold. Now, what you see on the screen now is what happens when you press and hold on this email that looked like it was coming from PayPal. So I held my finger on the link. I held my finger on the link uh, and just holding it there, it revealed the true site that you'd be sent to if you were to click. And so 
um, or, what, or if you just went there by pressing it and releasing. So pressing and holding gives you the same effect as hovering with a mouse on a computer. There's also a two letter code in that site uh, that you that you can't see right here, but it's dot AC. Now AC stands for the Ascension Island, and that is a country as well as an island. Only 800 people live there, but yet one person on that island has sent a phishing email that looks like it's coming from PayPal, designed to try to get access to my PayPal account by me falling for this and giving my PayPal credentials up. So be careful to be vigilant with links always and attachments. And with links, you can hover with the mouse, you can press and hold on your mobile device, and that gives you that preview to see if you're going to the place where it, you really think you, uh, you might be going. All right, would you wanna visit the Ascension Island? There's not much there. There's a neighboring island that has a hotel that's about, well, it's about 800 miles away. You wanna call that as a hotel that offers free Wi-Fi for guests. Would you use that free Wi-Fi for sensitive things? I can think of like five reasons why that's not a good idea, whether you're at a coffee shop down the street, whether you're at a remote island, or whether you're at a uh, an airport or a restaurant. Public Wi-Fi is not secure for several reasons. And you can see on the screen some of the issues that come up with using public Wi-Fi at, at any type of place, right? Whether you're out in the middle of the ocean or not. Virtual private networks protect our signal. If we're using sensitive communication or communicating that information, we want to protect that with a virtual private network. It's called a VPN. You can get those online for just a few dollars a month. Uh, and uh, if you want to, just turn off the cellular network of a mobile device, excuse me, turn off the Wi-Fi and use the cellular network of the mobile device. And that cellular network then is much more secure using that for sensitive information than a public Wi-Fi hotspot. I want to go uh, next and talk about account takeovers. Oh, this time let's focus on email accounts. Now, email accounts are, uh, if a criminal gets access to those, they can be used to commit fraud. And there's lots of phishing emails out there designed to trick us. Now, here's one that looks like it's coming from Microsoft Office 365. And if remember, there's always going to be a problem, an issue. And if you clicked on keep current password, that's going to send you to a fake login page for Office 365. If you clicked on the link here, because supposedly there's something wrong with your security for your Yahoo email account, you know, that's going to take you to a fake login page for Yahoo. For email account. Now, if you don't have a Yahoo email account or don't have Office 365, there's a lot of emails, phishing emails designed to steal credentials for those sites uh, as well. And you'll see on the next screen when it comes up that um, you'll see these type of terms, right? So these type of terms are always used to try to trick us. And when you see these things, act expeditiously, fix this problem before it gets worse. That's when you slow down, you do just the opposite of what they're saying. And you don't reset your password using a click like this or try to, because that's going to send you to a fake login page for whatever email account that they're targeting. And once they have your email credentials, bad things can happen. And I'll show you that uh, in just a second. So here's a couple of ideas for you in terms of email accounts, social media accounts, and also uh, financial accounts for obvious reasons. Once you get to the website, that's the correct place. You know you're there. You've logged in. Go ahead and save that login page as a bookmark in your browser or favorite in your browser. So you have those listed. You can go on into that folder and open up those pages anytime you want. Uh, because you know you'll be in the right place. You're not clicking on a link to get to a place. You're not um, you're not uh, searching for something or even typing things in all the time. Not only is it cumbersome, but you may make a mistake and end up in the wrong place if we do if we make a typing error as well. Using strong passwords is really important. I like pass phrases better than passwords. And at the end, I'm going to show you some ideas regarding pass phrases that I think you might like a better solution than passwords because passwords have a lot of inherent problems with them. Plus they're just a pain to use. One more thing, whether you're using a passphrase or a password, that is to use multi-factor authentication. When you think about it, the criminal could be six miles away. They could be 6,000 miles away. They can't log in to your account because even if they got your credentials from somewhere else, and it might not even be your fault, right? It could not be something that somebody else did they can't log in because the code comes to your device. Think about it this way. You're locking the door handle on your doorknob. You lock the deadbolt 
You have two factors of security. And that's what we're doing here virtually. And a lot of you are probably thinking, this just makes it inconvenient to log in. I got to put a code in every time I log into my financial account and my email accounts. That's true. It is an extra step. But it's also one that keeps those accounts much more secure than not having multi-factor or also called two-factor authentication. All right, so let's go back to that fake login page. So let's say a guy named Mike is victimized by this. He puts his credentials in at this fake login page. What's going to happen to Mike's email account? Well, the first thing that may happen is uh, they might try to affect Mike's contacts. Have you ever got an email that has just a link in it? Uh, that looks like it's coming from someone that you know, or maybe it's a post on Facebook or or some other social media that you may get from someone or 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 be or a reference, and then all of a sudden you're thinking, why did my friend send me this weird link? Let me click on it and see what happens. That's what you don't want to do. The link could put malware on your computer. It could uh, send you to a fake page to steal credentials, or make you subject to a ransomware attack, where they hold your computer hostage and. Don't give you access to your computer files until you pay money. All these things can happen in emails from people we know if we're not careful. So even if you get something and it looks like it's from someone that you know, especially if it takes a format like this, don't click on those links or attachments. Also, a couple of things to remember about transmitting sensitive information. Now, we all know how email accounts work. They have inboxes. Uh, and they have also other folders that you may uh, reference from time to time. You may send sensitive information to maybe an accountant or a lawyer or a financial advisor. And all oh, that sensitive information could be an attachment or it could be actually in the email. And then you may delete that after they respond and say, we've received this information, but it's still in the sent folder and it's still in your trash folder. Even if you delete it from your inbox and your sent folder, criminals know to look there. We don't want that information hanging around in email accounts on the occasion that they might get hijacked. So, if you have the opportunity when you're transmitting sensitive information, especially social security numbers, routing information, information for bank accounts and account numbers, make sure you use a secure way to do that. And most of those uh, organizations we work with should provide you with a secure client portal or a basically a vault to upload that information securely, not letting it go through normal email channels. Wire transfer fraud is a big issue today. The most money we would ever wire transfer in our lifetime is probably when we're wiring money to purchase a house. So make sure if you are in this boat or someone else you, you know, a family member or a friend, remind them never to wire money uh, based on email instructions. Always call to verify the money is going to the right place. And this is why we do that. Now, we see the losses for 2021 this has been updated with even more losses for 2022, but what you're seeing on the screen are four individual examples coming out of the FBI's crime report where people have lost this much money because they were buying a house and they wired it without calling first to make sure it was going to the right place. So whenever you get a message to wire money, whether it's for any, any reason, buying a house or anything, Always call at a number you know to be for an organization, not one that's in the email, because that could be part of the sophisticated trick. Call at a number you know to be for that organization and make sure that money's going to the right place. Having just bought a house myself within the past couple of years, my daughter bought a house about a year ago. We know how important this is to protect your money. And as you approach retirement or, or if you're going into retirement or already contemplating that you want to preserve your money and you may be doing real estate transactions as you maybe move to a different part of the country. Be careful about wire transferring money. Always, always call to get the proper instructions to make sure it's not going to a criminal's bank account who has hijacked an email account. Ransomware is a big issue today. And the way we stay safe from ransomware is to not click on attachments and emails that we get that are again designed to elicit an emotional reaction. Isn't everybody expecting a package today? But even if you are expecting a package, you aren't going to click on a link that comes in an email, right? Get the routing number, go to FedEx's website, and make sure that you go to that, uh, put in that routing number to check on, on the status of a package, not through these emails or pop-ups that you may get. Could install malware on your computer. The malware will look like this. After it's loaded on your computer, you'll get a message that all your files are encrypted. There's a countdown clock. You have 72 hours and counting or your files. You'll never see your files alive again, just like they used to kidnap people in the old days. That's called a ransomware attack. 
For individuals, they ask for $500 for businesses, for government institutions. It's a lot more money than that. If you live in the Baltimore area, you may know that Baltimore has had their whole city computers hijacked through a ransomware attack a couple of years ago. They reverted to manual systems until they got that resolved and they were also attacked again. So how do we stay safe uh, from ransomware attacks? Well, if you pay the ransom, by the way, they might give you your key. Uh, they may not. There's no guarantees, but you will get a satisfaction survey to see how you were satisfied or not with the ransomware service they provided. And it is a business. That's exactly what they're running is a profit oriented business designed to steal or hijack your information, hold it hostage until you pay a ransom. You may even get a little survey that looks like this. You know, it's almost gotten to that point. So how do we stay safe? It's the three, two, one rule of backups. Have three copies of your files in two different places, at least one being offsite with the cloud being offsite. So I like to back up all my important files every once in a while, put it on a hard drive or a thumb drive, take it off the computer, stick it in a drawer. You'll at least have that to recover from. Family pictures, important documents that you don't want to get locked up on a computer or lose in the event of an issue with your computer. Put the rest in the cloud that backs up automatically. They're considered to be reliable and secure cloud services to protect information. And in the case of a ransomware attack, you'll be able to recover from there as well. But you'll have two different places to recover from in the event that you should be attacked by clicking on the wrong thing in an email, which is generally how it happens. Last portion of my presentation, I wanna talk about ways to keep your computer safe that we haven't touched on already. The first is beware of the dreaded pop-up. Now, pop-ups can serve a purpose. They can also be nefarious. Um, Watch out for pop-ups that look like this. Don't click on the protect now. That could download malware to your computer. Don't even click on the X. That could download malware to your computer. So on my handout, you will see information about how to get out of that safely. If you get a pop-up like that, don't click anywhere in the pop-up. Use the control alt delete function, or if it's a Mac, the command option escape function. function. Hold down three keys at the same time. You'll see it on the handout. That will give you bring up a task manager and allow you to get rid of that pop-up that you see is being generated here. That's what it looks like. It's not those first four programs, right? And then what we're going to do is end task by clicking on end task, and that pop-up should disappear from your screen. Also, watch out for tech support scam pop-ups. Tech support scams are a big money raiser for criminals. Last year, it generated reported crimes alone, $800 million dollars to the criminals, $800 million, and that's a lot of profit. That's just reported. So here's how they do it. You get a pop-up on your screen. There's a number in it. They want you to call the number. They ask to help you. They're going to help you solve your problem, whatever it is, and you're going to give them remote access to your computer. That's what they want you to do. But you're not going to do that because this is a trick. They could steal information. They could put malware on your computer or even worse, never give remote access under these circumstances. Listen, if you're dealing with Microsoft or Apple or the Best Buy Geek Squad and you've called them and you've determined it's the right number and they're asking you to solve a problem, you're asking them to solve a problem and they want remote access, that's okay. You've started that process, but not as a result of a number that you call in a pop-up. Don't even call the number and certainly don't give them remote access. When they want to get paid, they will ask for a variety of different ways, but mostly they fall back to gift cards. If you hear that term in any online communication, don't do it. It's 100% of the time a scam, right? It's just like cash. It can be transferred to them by you reading a gift card number that you just bought at a store or over the computer, even more convenient, and that transfers the money to them just like cash. There's no legitimate reason why any organization that's acting in the normal business setting will ask you to pay by gift card. Uh, it just doesn't make sense. FBI crime report uh, talks also about uh, tech support scams. As you see here, lots of money from that. The latest crime report says it's gone to $800 million last year. Romance scams, we could talk a long time about that. Please, if you have a family member that's vulnerable, we're talking about people that have lost a loved one. It could be a widow or a widower. Criminals even go after other people in different situations in their life. It starts out with profile fake photos. They ask for money. And if someone you've met online or you know someone, they've met someone online, they ask for money. It is, again, 100% of the time a scam. Be that trusted resource for family members, friends, neighbors that might be in the situation. 
So you can stop them before they send money. Once they send money, they rationalize that behavior and they want to send even more money till they drain their accounts dry. That's the typical MO for the, for the romance scammer. Lots of money being lost that way as well. Uh, also, there's other types of wire fraud and mail and uh, gift card scams. But does it make sense that a law enforcement agency has an arrest warrant for you? Then you can get out of the arrest warrant by paying with a gift card. Does that make sense? Do you think the FBI is locking up people's computers and asking for a gift card to unlock them? Really? When I worked for the FBI, listen, 20 years and I locked people's computers. I only asked for cash to unlock them. It had to be small bills and non-sequential serial numbers. That was my MO when, when I worked for the FBI. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, on a more serious note, grandchild grandparent scam, uh, you probably know about that. It's when they call up acting like they're a grandchild in trouble. You may have family members who've gotten these calls. Uh, now they're using artificial intelligence to take voice exemplars from TikTok and other media where kids have posted videos and then they're plugging that into AI and getting it to say anything they want, even more convincing for a potential victim grandparent. So be careful of uh, that type of thing no, and uh, let family members know if a grandchild calls up and says they're in trouble, hang up the phone, call them back at a number you know to be for them to make sure they're really in trouble. You'll have time to help them if they are really in need. Other types of scams involving emotional drivers. What's another way to drive people's emotions? Greed, right? Does it make sense that you won a lottery that you didn't enter or the, that you get winnings from the lottery? by paying winnings in advance? Yeah, pay, pay us 10,000. That's just the taxes. And then you'll get your million dollars. None of that makes sense, right? And what's this astronaut with $15 million? Did you know this? There's a Nigerian astronaut on a Soviet space station. Yeah, he's been there since before the Soviet Union even broke up. And, and since 1990, 33 years, he's been there. We've only heard about it when we got this email. That's just amazing. Now, sometimes when you see scams as ridiculous as this, or some that are more sophisticated, there's always going to be things that don't make sense. Don't let emotions impede your ability to see those things that don't make sense, right? And here, we can see this already, what doesn't make sense. He's got a bunch of money. Somehow in American dollars, he's being paid while he's on the Soviet space station for all these years. And why does he need your money to launch this rescue mission? See, that doesn't make sense. And by the way, don't mess with these people. Don't respond. Don't say, take me off your list. Or don't play with them and say, Hey, uh, yeah, well, I'm going to give you the money and make it act like you're going to you're going to give them money. And then, you know, you'll validate your email address. You'll validate your phone number. Probably you'll get inundated with those type of things. Unsubscribe when you see unsubscribe um, in a usually a blue font, at the bottom of an email. If you've done business with the company, you recognize their emails. Go ahead and unsubscribe if you don't want to get their emails anymore. But anything else you should send to your spam folder market is junk depending on your email provider and you'll get less of those as your email filtering will do a better job based on those decisions, but never reply to these unwanted things that validate your email address. And we'll go on to the next slide here in just a second. So, all right. I, all right. Um, Keep your software updated, uh, whether you have Windows or Mac uh, or an iPhone or an Android. If you get messages that you, an update is waiting, go ahead and update that product and also update your browser as well. Now, here are two emails that I got that look like they're coming from organizations that we all recognize, McAfee. Uh, here's one that looks like it's coming from Costco. Those are not from those organizations, but I wanted to see what would happen next. So I clicked through, I took some precautions and I clicked through and my browser, which is Google Chrome, blocked those, uh, blocked my next step. It said, don't go here. We keep track of these things and we know that's going to lead you to a deceptive site. So your browser is serving as a le level or a layer of security as well. So when you see a notation in your browser, uh, usually on the landing page, this is for Google's uh, Chrome browser, uh, it says update. Go ahead and update your browser as well. You might use Microsoft Edge or use Safari or Firefox. Uh, if it's not set to update automatically, then you'll have to update it manually when you see this. That keeps you safe against the latest threats because um, they keep track of those things and know the websites that some of those links are sending us to. All right, my last thing uh, is using passphrases. Last point of this presentation, and passphrases are better than passwords for two reasons. Um, first of all, if you use a weak password, 
If you use a weak password uh, or simple password, uh, the criminals can guess it with brute force attacks using powerful computers and software. They'll be in your account in a matter of seconds. Passphrases, you can't do that because they're inherently strong based on their length. Now, passwords also are vulnerable to credential stuffing. And so you get a two for one special with passphrases as they prevent that from happening too. And if you get a two for one special, who doesn't like that? So think about passphrases as a way to solve both these issues. And you're probably thinking, hold on a second, Jeff, what is credential stuffing? All right, let's go to a mic in the email. So look to the left. What you see here is Mike put his credentials in this fake login page for Gmail. I showed you that earlier in the presentation. Now, the criminals went into Mike's email account and they saw that Mike was getting emails from a credit card company. So they opened up a new window in their browser and put in Mike's credentials at the credit card company's login page. And sure enough, Mike used the exact same username and password. Now, this, as they say in the movies, this is based on a true story. This happened in Kansas City, exact same thing. Lots of losses, lots of victims because people were not using different passwords for different sites and they were victim, victims of credential stuffing. Now that's where past phrases come in. So think about something unique, unique about Amazon. They have free delivery two days, one day, same day, if you have Prime, of course, and Amazon is moving towards free delivery yesterday. So I'm using this because it's unique to Amazon. I'm not gonna use it on my email site. I'm not gonna use it on my social security site. I'm using it only for Amazon. That's the whole idea of a passphrase is that you make it unique, funny if you want, or something that's memorable like this. For your social security account, I like show me the money. That's a nice one, but you can't use all lowercase show me the money like we did with Amazon's uh, uh, password. Here, you have to put lowercase, uppercase, lowercase numbers and symbols. Still, we can't remember all our passphrases. The average person has about 50 online accounts. So there's a couple of ideas for you here. First of all, on my handout, you'll see information about passphrase managers, uh, password managers, they're also called. Keeper's a good one. I use that. There's Dashlane and other ones listed there. They're considered to be reliable and secure. There's free versions and paid versions. Check them out for what you want for features and for price. Uh, they're considered to be very, very good at managing the passwords in your life. You can also put passwords or phrases in a note on a mobile device. When you go to save that note, you'll be able to assign a password to it by hitting in the note, you hit, uh, instead of save, you hit, instead of done, you hit um, something that says lock the note, and you can put a password that uh, will lock that note down, and no one can get access to that note without what you typed in there. So uh, you can use that as a way to store your passwords at home too, or on a, on a mobile device, which is uh, again, locked down during, by two levels of security. All right, need to summarize my key point here. So we talk about setting your online social security account. Uh, you'll do that you'll, uh, to keep safe from social security benefits fraud. When you reach the age of 62, it's particularly important. Freeze your credit reports. You can protect, prevent lots of fraud by keeping your credit reports frozen. Watch out for fake phone calls and text messages. Uh, don't respond to those unsolicited calls with personal information or by going to websites. Protect your mail and protect your trash. Better yet, get less mail, have less trash. Sign up for electronic delivery. You'll have less paper to deal with. Keep that malware off your computer. Don't click on attachments and emails from unknown or suspicious senders. Uh, when you log in to your email accounts and other accounts like financial accounts, social media, that big three to protect, make sure you're logging in directly, not through links. Set up alerts on your financial accounts so you'll know when money is moving. You can take steps to reverse it if it's fraud and prevent further fraud immediately. Use multi-factor authentication that keeps us safe uh, by keeping the bad actors out of our online accounts. As I mentioned earlier, great tool for that. And then finally using past phrases. And I'm gonna use uh, this example. So my family, as I mentioned, used to watch The Godfather every Christmas. We watched it religiously on Christmas day, a weird tradition, but we waited for a phrase in the movie to take a break to celebrate Christmas. And Godfather one is three hours long. About an hour into the movie, we heard this phrase that's when we took a break. The phrase was this one, leave the gun, take the cannoli. So that's when we stopped the movie. My mom got a box of cannoli. We celebrated Christmas in my family. I know that's a weird tradition. 
not my family. And that's me, not me. That's my family. Anyway, I'm going to use that as my passphrase for my favorite streaming service. Bet you can't guess what this is. There it is. I'm going to leave the gun and take the cannoli. I'm also going to take out the spaces because you can't have spaces and passphrases. And there it is. It's super strong against credential stuffing, against brute force hacking. You could be protected too with passphrases, but don't use this one. It's already taken. All right. I'm going to stop right there. I want to thank you for your attention. I do have a book on cybercrime. Check it out on my website if you're interested. Other than that, I am going to stop there and try to address, I think I have some time in the next eight minutes or so to address some of the questions that were in the chat box. Is it okay to do that at this point, Jeannie? Uh, yeah, yeah. Can. sorry, yeah. we're all yeah. here. Um, yes, go ahead and, and review the chat box if you're more comfortable doing it that way. Um, I've answered a couple, but um, just